Hey everyone, thanks for coming. Um, I'm Chigyasa Grover. Um, I'm the AI and research lead at Bodo AI. And today we'll be talking about how um, and why do we need to guard our ML galaxy and go beyond accuracy to privacy and security. Uh, in March 2018, uh, the New York Times, The Observer, and The Guardian, they uncovered some cache documents revealing the Cambridge Analytica's, which is a British data and consulting firm, access to personal Facebook data. With the help of a former employee, it was disclosed uh, that Cambridge Analytica had exploited this data to influence the 2016 US elections using tactics likened to what we call psychological warfare. And I think this is more important as we approach the election season all over again. Uh, in 2013, the research had kind of like laid the groundwork for tactics predicting like private traits from online behavior data, particularly from Facebook. But not a lot of people paid any attention to the research that was done in 2013. So when um, in 2018, uh, nearly data of nearly 87 million Facebook users was obtained via a simple quiz app called This Is Your Digital Life, uh, and people kind of like shared their own uh, life uh, likings and dislikes, personality traits were not only captured from the target users, but also from all their friend groups. So uh, Cambridge Analytica, very smartly, they combined this data with social media profiles, enabling them to create highly accurate uh, psychographic profiles about 30 million people, raising concerns um, about you know, their likely involvements in political movements uh, like Brexit or alleged ties with Russia. In 2020, uh, Facebook ultimately ended up paying 550 US million dollars to settle a class um, action lawsuit over its use of facial recognition technology in the state of Illinois. And using data of like millions of users where they were like training photo tagging uh, feature. Um, and this, like this, there have been many other privacy breaches, like data was either leaked due to hacking, poor cloud security, scraping, various companies, not only Facebook, just like LinkedIn, Pixar, what? Wattpad, Target, and whatnot. However, the Facebook Cambridge Analytica fiasco was the most blood curdling one. And the scandal truly put spotlight on the privacy standards that we lack and the regulations that we really need, thereby sparking like a public awakening moment worldwide. The Facebook data breach wasn't really a hack. It was a wake up call for all of us. And owing to the substantial information that uh, the ML systems today possess, uh, they're often prey to varied attacks. The examples include bypassing simple spam filters, disfiguring features for failing uh, recognition systems, bamboozling road signs to mislead autonomous vehicles, forging voice commands for digital assistance, playing with words for befooling sentiment anal analyzers, and so on. These attacks can be targeted either towards the data the model or the infrastructure aspect of any ML-powered framework, thereby exploiting their vulnerabilities. Technically, the attacks on ML systems can be categorized based on either the intent of the attacker or the stage at which the attack is made. So if an attacker tries to obtain information about the ML system and use it to further their plan, it's called espionage. And if the goal is to disrupt the system altogether, it's called sabotage. And if the endeavor, the end goal is to game the system for your own personal advantage, it's called fraud. So these are the three categories. And these attacks then can further be done either on the training stage or the inference stage of any ML pipeline. That being, evasion is one of the most common types of attacks. It focuses on fabricating an input to do deceive the model during inference. They're poisoning attacks that are similar for models, particularly online training. So if you're trying to furnish some input examples that would shift the decision boundaries of an ML model, they would be poisoning attacks. They would be trojaning attacks, trying to gain access to a particular model or its parameters to then reverse engineer the training data to retrain the model. Um, and then there's backdooring, which is kind of like an adversarial attack. Uh, reprogramming is another which uh, you're trying to perform a task uh, designed by an attacker without them needing to compute specific desired output, so on and so forth. Uh, this is a very big topic. Um, we can take almost 10 days to talk about this. But I think for our use case particularly, the most relevant type of attack is the privacy attack, which is done uh, to further your plan of action and specifically during inference stage. And the idea is either to expose the model or the data. 
And these types of attacks are extremely threatening, especially uh, where the underlying data is very sensitive. It contains personal information, uh, your chat history, your financial information, healthcare information, and so on. Um, and the learning logic or the algorithm in itself is highly sensitive, and it could expose the model parameters or the training data itself. Before diving into uh, the categorization of all the privacy attacks, we need to first define what does privacy in machine learning actually mean. Um, and what it means to have a breach in privacy uh, in our ML model. So um, here uh, we leverage uh, Delinius's desideratum to put forward a pragmatic definition for privacy in machine learning. A model should not disclose any attribute of the input on which it is applied, other than what we would have known without even applying the model. So basically the thing is, if you have an input and you're giving it to a model, the model should not expose any other sensitive attributes of the input, which you would not have known otherwise. So this is what we call privacy in machine learning. Um, and that is uh, how the breach occurs can also be two ways. Either you get inference about the members of the population. So we can say a breach occurs if an attacker can reverse engineer the model's output to infer any unwarranted sensitive attributes of the input, specifically um, in a case where the model is intelligently able to discern correlation between input's highly sensitive attributes and the target variable that we're trying to predict. Uh, any breach in any one single input's attribute can lead to the exposure of all the other attributes that we have for our input. And since uh, you know ML models are smart, they are highly generalizable. Uh, if they can accurately predict um, attribute for one, they are able to accurately predict the output for all. So it basically means that um, any input or parameter that you can infer about any single input, you would be able to expose the entire population. So this is one type of like inference. The other is uh, the entire population's privacy can be hard to maintain. So it is customarily the focus should be to protect the confidentiality of, let's say, only the training set that you're focusing on. Um, and since all the members that you use in any machine learning system are kind of like a superset of the training data that you train your model on, it is essential uh, to comprehend what attributes uh, of an individual training data point um, a model exposes as compared to the remaining members of the uh, population. Um, I know it can be a little uh, tough to understand, but the idea is to quantify uh, the liability of a data point being in a training set, which is kind of like you're risking the membership of it. So if you're like exposing the attributes of even a single training data point, you end up exposing uh, attributes of all the entire population. So membership risk or property inference uh, attacks kind of like fall into this category. So privacy in ML systems, how are they caused and why are they caused? They primarily arise due to using non-processed public data sets, using confidential data like healthcare, financial, chat history, without any sort of anonymization or encryption, sharing training data snapshots in an unprotected way, exposing the model parameter configuration, or revealing more information to the end user um, than what is actually required to share. So there can be other ways, but these are the major reasons uh, that causes breach in privacy in ML systems. And um, in order to wield um, ML safely, it is vital to quantify um, the privacy risks in different parts of the system. So here are uh, the top two uh, ML privacy meter and ML doctor are two open source libraries that help you audit privacy in statistical and machine learning algorithms. So the idea is the tool helps uh, in data protection impact assessment by providing a quantitative analysis of the fundamental risks of machine learning. So these kind of like operate by generating different types of attacks on a given ML system and the corresponding accuracy that is being affected. So it can be like a white box or like a black box access to the model. So white boxes, you get access not only to the input and the output, but also the inside parameters. And black boxes, you just get access to input and output. So they use these different configurations and try to quantify um, how um, risk averse your model is or not. And then there is another ML doctor, which is again um, an open source modular design kind of uh, library, which helps you perform a holistic risk assessment of inference privacy attacks against ML models. 
Um, it is geared to evaluate the different types of attacks that we talked about, membership, uh, parameter inference, input inference, and so on, thereby enabling any ML model owners to assess the potential security and privacy risks of deploying their models to production. So the framework has four different uh, components, the data processing module, the attack module, defense module, and evaluation module. So the idea is um, how do processing data sets can mount to different attacks or perform the actual inference attack uh, to deploy mitigation techniques and see if an attack has happened, can ML model kind of like uh, def uh, defend itself? Or to evaluate if attack happens, how do you uh, evaluate the performance of it and how do you immediately stop? So these are some of the tools that you can definitely check out. And there are the other techniques like feature sensitivity analysis, ML surrogacy, and so on. Uh, Rishabh can take you forward with the privacy preserving machine learning aspect. Thanks, Vikasa. Um, so yeah, we have talked about uh, like the premise for the talk. Now, uh, what we want to dive into is how we can do preserve, pri uh, privacy preserving machine learning. So machine learning systems have the potential to mimic human intelligence and perform complex operations if they are trained effectively. However, empirically, we have seen that these ML systems are as good as the data they kind of ingest. And it is imperative to have a large quantity of data to enable these ML models to discern compelling and uh, exploit explanatory patterns. Now, one of the conventional ways for uh, having an exhausting, uh, exhaustive data set for model training uh, for the use cases like text completion, object detection, and so on, is to pool data from multiple sources. So uh, to take an example, like LLMs like uh, ChatGPT and uh, Gemini, etc., are trained on uh, the text from the entire web. That's why like they are uh, very powerful. Uh, but the past studies uh, in the privacy preserving machine learning have shown that uh, when we train on such a large data, uh, we uh, kind of incur a risk to expose sensitive information and that have the implications of exposing privacy in unexpected ways. So to take an example, uh, for example, pre-trained uh, language models, if you try to fine tune them on confidential data, those can be misused to kind of recover private information uh, for the companies that kind of used it. Other things could be generative models can unintentionally memorize uh, unique training uh, samples we had in the training data set and that attacker can use to kind of uh, uh, re, uh, work backwards and identify personally identifiable information uh, for the folks that kind of gave their data set for model training. So as Jigasa kind of mentioned before, the ability to infer even a single user's identity and conclude if they were kind of part of the training data set is a breach of privacy. And what we want to kind of focus on here is provide a sort of a suite of kind of techniques that we can adopt to make sure that our machine learning models have the privacy baked in. Um, this kind of ensures that uh, there is trust between the service providers and the users and we retain the confidentiality of the data uh, of the users which are in a particular ecosystem and uh, uh, basically stay compliant with the latest regulations and policy that are in place. Otherwise, for example, like Facebook had to pay a huge sum of money to kind of uh, settle, settle the privacy breach that kind of occurred. So in the following slides, like we'll go through different uh, kind of techniques that, that may ensure uh, that we bake in privacy into these ML systems. And the first one uh, of that uh, technique in the suite is differential privacy. So to take a medical diagnosis application as an example, uh, we might not want the machine learning algorithm to kind of memorize sensitive information about the training data for the folks 
who are kind of uh, we are trying to make the predictions for such as specific kind of med medical histories for the patient so that is like a very sensitive information so in such cases differential privacy int can introduce randomness into our learning algorithm and obscure the contribution from individual uh, records in a data set that may correspond to a uh, real life person and that's that way like obscure the uh, obscure all the individual contributions but still be able to capture the essential statistical patterns which kind of machine learning systems work on this randomness could be achieved by introducing a carefully tuned noise uh, during the competition and uh, one call out would be if you are kind of introducing the noise that has the trade off with the model performance so baking in the privacy into our ml systems comes with the trade off that our model might not perform at that level but that is kind of essential to make sure that uh, no leakage happens which has like bigger repercussions uh, specifically for differential privacy so in machine learning we usually use a st stochastic gradient descent algorithm um, to kind of tune our model parameters so what differential privacy uh, does is during that process of calculating the gradients uh, we try to um, uh, introduce like uh, some Gaussian noise and try to clip the gradients uh, at a certain point so that uh, not uh, not the full information for for that kind of data instance is used and we have some anonymization happening and uh, that way like we are able to like maintain the privacy uh, for the records which are included in the uh, training process um, in general um, this technique comes from like uh, intersection of like various fields like mathematics cryptography and machine learning and it has seen like very uh, uh, success in the public purposes uh, considering data utility data accuracy privacy and security benefits uh, so yeah this uh, whenever we talk about like privacy preserving ml this uh, is like the first thing that comes up uh, next technique uh, it's not entirely like a privacy preserving uh, technique but it has like good impl uh, implications for uh, maintaining the privacy uh, so federated learning is a decentralized kind of model training where we don't have to pull in all the data that we uh, need for model training into one place that can stay in like a safe location um, and it assumes uh, heterogeneous and non uh, iid distributed data so iid is independent and identically distributed uh, data so here the main um, main USP comes from utilizing the data in its original location, uh, which kind of reduces privacy concerns and network bandwidth requirements. So after training the model, only the model parameters are exchanged rather than like data flowing into uh, uh, flowing into like disparate systems. We just uh, update the models uh, individually uh, uh, at specific locations and only the parameters are kind of exchanged which kind of diminishes the data traceability risks uh, these uh, are federated learning is kind of crucial for scenarios like self-driving vehicles and healthcare where retaining data sovereignty uh, is really important uh, at the time of model training it differs from distributed learning uh, by focusing on diverse set of data points um, and utilizing potentially unreliable edge devices for competition. So for example, self-driving vehicles, they might drive in some remote locations at which point they might not have connectivity. 
they have the model uh, kind of baked in within the device. They have the data from the sensors. And then uh, we do the model training for each vehicle. And whenever they get connectivity, they exchange the model parameters with the centrally located model. And that's how like the uh, continuous learning happens. And at, at this point, none of the data is being exchanged. We are just exchanging the model parameters update. So um, unintuitively, federated learning can be centralized or decentralized. And it's not exactly uh, uh, what it may seem. So in case of centralized federated learning, what it means that we have a central server, which kind of handles the model distribution and aggregation. Uh, but this can become a bottleneck if uh, uh, there is only one place which kind of receives all the updates. Uh, if you consider like large scale nature, like if you have million vehicles and we have just one central server, it may quickly become like a bottleneck. Uh, at the same time, decentralized federated learning allows us to exchange the updates uh, asynchronously between different points. Uh, a point in case of self-driving example, you can consider like vehicles are points. Let's say they can talk to each other when the model uh, is kind of updated and exchange information to improve like the global model. So in a sense, like federated learning is revolu revolutionizing industry, uh, like banking and healthcare and self-driving industry. Uh, and at the same time, they preserve data confidentiality because none of the data is actually kind of exchanged. So um, in, in that sense, like uh, this is like the second most uh, used kind of uh, technique uh, to do privacy preserving machine learning. There are some downsides still for uh, this technique. Uh, for example, um, there is like lack of encryption in place uh, that can potentially allow attackers to steal at least like the model updates and the communication happening between the nodes. So it does require like some extra efforts uh, to kind of ensure we we are able to protect whatever data is being exchanged. And then uh, again, like when whenever neural networks are kind of included, uh, they have unintentionally uh, have the tendency to memorize the training data. So um, all of these should be like considered into account whenever we are trying to like evaluate like different tools. Uh, next set of uh, techniques that usually come up for privacy preserving machine learning is the use of synthetic data. So uh, we, we have like uh, some, something called like data anonymization uh, in place, which try to like protect the sensitive information by randomly encoding, let's say, if you have the username to some like random hash or something like that. But uh, those doesn't like, uh, protect us from like reverse engineering, let's say the particular technique that was used for anonymization at which point all the data is kind of uh, exposed. So for synthetic data uh, generated using like machine learning algorithms or simulators, uh, they provide a way to create new data that retains the original attributes and correlations. Uh, but are not really the original data. So that's why like they provide some privacy benefits. Uh, they aim to like strike a balance between uh, data utility and privacy protection uh, by maintaining the original attributes in a different way. Uh, for example, keeping the statistical properties the same, but having the actual values as something different. So they enable like the uh, enable like insights which we can get from original data, but at the same time, like if someone tries to go into the data and 
really identify who all was included in training like can we identify their attributes for example medical histories for some patient that won't be possible so depending on the limit to which the original data is included in the uh, synthetic data fabrication there could be like two types of categories so partial synthetic data contains a selection of uh, original data uh, where only like few attributes are imputed which have the higher risk of disclosure for example if we have like patient data uh, medical hist history is one of the most sensitive attributes so if we just only produce synthetic data for that aspect and retain all the original attributes that is uh, falling in the category of partial synthetic data uh, this does provide us like best best of kind of both worlds we have the original high quality data for the attributes that are not so sensitive and for the other part which is uh, more sensitive we try to like generate synthetic data uh, there is a case where we can also generate like fully synthetic data uh that provides like higher uh, privacy guarantees but there is a big trade off with the model performance in that case um so basically uh, in general like the guidance we have is whenever uh, the data is small and we have only few attributes and uh, we can generate good models to impute that data we should adopt like fully synthetic data approach but in case uh, which is usually the case in like real world scenarios where the data is huge and we have large amount of attributes associated uh, within the each row so in that sense like we can identify the highly sensitive attributes and only try to like generate uh, synthetic data for those attributes uh, another interesting uh, kind of um, uh, topic within the realm of synthetic data is defects so usually defects are associated with something negative but those could come in like really handy if we were to trying to like let's say train a model or uh, for some specific task where the data was not even available so usually um, one of the most popular domains where synthetic data is used is like computer vision so along with like providing faster and cost effective uh, data creation at scale it also helps in building edge cases that might be very rare occurrences in real life so uh, one quick example i can think of is like uh, for like self driving scenarios uh, there might be like cases uh, which the car hasn't seen uh, we can utilize let's say defect technology to produce those cases and have the car kind of learn all those like tricky situations uh, where uh, let's say <laughs> we don't want like some accidents to happen in real life so so that like we can learn from it so that's where it comes like really handy um as for the challenges to kind of close out this uh, topic is that uh, generating synthetic data requires specialized skills in ai and like deep understanding of how the original data is kind of composed and its impact on the systems so we can have challenges around like realism when we are trying to generate synthetic data they could be biased introduced in the process of generating the synthetic data and uh, at the same time we have to consider privacy as well uh, as an added aspect so uh, bias is like a big thing because recently there have been like cases where uh, uh we use uh, data from like specific sources and that doesn't cover all the statistics of the entire population so if that happens like our ml models learn completely different things uh, 
so that is like uh, one of the things to kind of consider um then uh, yeah one small topic is around like data condensation so this is different from like synthetic data generation which tries to uh, generate identical data set to the original data set condensation focuses on creating informative samples uh, from the original set for like efficient learning and that is not always comparable to the original data set so this is kind of just like uh, uh, diving deeper into the model to see what makes the model tick and according to those properties trying to sample some original uh, some data from the original set and making sure we are able to cover all the examples uh lastly like apart from all the techniques we kind of talked about there are like small techniques like perturbation pseudo anonymization and homomorphic encryption uh that we can use to uh kind of quickly uh try out some uh some uh, techniques uh that may introduce let's say random noise into the model updates or hide the personally uh, identifiable information and uh, encrypt some sort of communications between the model uh, updates uh, so all of these could be used as an additional tools to ensure privacy preserving aspect uh, so jigesa will talk more about Yeah, thanks, uh, Rishabh, for walking us uh, through highly technical uh, techniques for preserving privacy in machine learning. These are, of course, not like a single topic for a day. Uh, you could spend days and hours reading more about it. But what the crux is that the past privacy breaches and data leaks have ignited a sense of concern in individuals all across the world, um, as we termed it, the Great Privacy Awakening. So we're very cautious. The users are now very cautious about like what personal data they want to give to these huge corporations and companies to train their models on. Uh, not only uh, so government officials, regulators, organizations, researchers, practitioners from various disciplines are now increasingly getting involved in data and ML governance. Uh, the effort is particularly focused on preparing like a framework, like a generic framework for the responsible and ethical use of data in machine learning models in order to maintain a trust among all the stakeholders that are involved. Privacy is now like one of the key pillars of building a responsible LM ML system. particularly when sensitive data as we talked about health records financial transactions personal conversations are involved um, and apart from elementary principles of privacy like purposeful cataloging data collection or limitation of data collection anonymization high quality checks accountability individual participation and so on it is very imperative to stay compliant with the government enforced privacy regulations both at a regional level as well as a global level uh, specifically for companies like social media who operate in worldwide there are like different privacy data regulations and privacy laws that they need to take care of and needless to say a uh, non compliant systems pose a threat to individuals who are specifically the end users of these services uh, and are often the ones uh, whose privacy is majorly compromised as well as the owning entity which is subject to heavy hefty penalties forced uh, deletion of data models algorithms and what not um, as of today 137 out of 194 countries have put in place legislation to secure protection of data and privacy uh, amongst all the data security laws uh, privacy laws out there the ones by eu european union and the united states of america are considered to be the most comprehensive ones um, as they cover almost every aspect of the vulnerability known so far the eu's gdpr uh, which is known as the privacy law which was implemented in 2018 especially after the facebook cambridge analytica scandal enhances individual control over personal data and addresses data transfer outside of the eu so if you're training a model on the data that was generated in the eu the data cannot leave the premise of eu so it kind of like faces a very huge threat of like the transfer of data and the privacy cannot be breached during that sense um and gdpr it sets strict standards for personal data handling it requires explicit consent at every login every session that you do 
transparency, and security during collection, granting individual rights to each individual to access and delete their data whenever they want to. Uh, while GDPR primarily targets um, irresponsible data processing, it is noteworthy uh, that it's a regulation and not a directive. So it is directly binding to all the corporations out there, but it's obviously adaptable by each member state. Strong enforcement of GDPR has led to significant fines for violations to Amazon, WhatsApp, Google, and whatnot for all these privacy breaches. Um, and the success of GDPR, on the other hand, has inspired so many countries, including Turkey, Mauritius, Chile, Japan, Brazil, South Korea, South Africa, Argentina, and Kenya, to adopt similar data protection laws. Uh, here uh, in California, uh, the CCPA is kind of like similar to GDPR, but the catch is it's only for the members of California. It applies to California residents aiming to enhance privacy rights and consumer protection. It grants individual rights such as knowledge of when your personal data is being collected, the ability to request deletion. I myself have gone to my old accounts and requested uh, deletion of my uh, data and protection against discrimination based on any privacy preferences that you have done. It allows uh, residents to sue businesses for damages in case of violations and so on. Uh, US on its own has had its privacy laws, a history of privacy laws, including the US Privacy Act of 1974, HIPAA, COPA, GLBA, alongside with numerous state level privacy laws. But what we ne need right now is a federal level. Um, so across the globe as well, uh, many countries have their own regulations to ensure trust amongst corporations, agencies, and the end users. So Australia has its own APA, Canada has PIPEDA, India has Information Technology Act, Italy has its own, UK has its own implementation of GDPR, uh, Japan's Act on Pro uh, Protection of Personal Information, APPI, so on. So these are all the acts that are there out in the world. Um, and though all these privacy laws are aim aiming to protect individuals' privacy rights based on their target criteria, they can be categorized as two, horizontal laws or vertical laws. So horizontal laws, uh, they oversee how organizations, they use information regardless of the context. So they can encompass like biometric data, retina scans, fingerprints, um, and other PIIs such as name and address. Vertical laws, on the other hand, they safeguard medical records um, or any specific type of data. So there's horizontal that is regardless of the context and their vertical laws like uh, HIPAA, for example, they safeguard the medical data and so on. So with so many laws uh, regulating present day ML powered systems, it is definitely a challenging task to balance them with ceaseless developments and technology. There's always an ongoing battle of like, should we focus on innovation or should we focus on responsibility? Additionally, as more and more hands are getting involved in this private data digitally, it is very vital to understand the interplay between privacy regulations and technological advancements. So we should aim to strike a balance between two so for a future where trust and harmony are maintained. And with that, uh, there, there are so many emerging trends that are evol evolving uh, to you know, have regulations around privacy and confidentiality, enhancing privacy at each step of the data pipeline, not just training of the model or collection of the data, uh, and of course, adoption of decentralized algorithmic learning as Rishabh kind of like walked us through. And with that, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for coming to our talk and happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Correct. Yeah. So there is a parameter like epsilon, which kind of aims to control the level of noise. So if we give epsilon like more value, it adds, I think, like less noise. Uh, and the noise is just like a Gaussian noise with like zero standard deviation in one mean. And be based on this property, like we just control how much noise we are adding. So if we add like more noise, 
that reduces the model performance which is kind of expected so we have to like carefully tune the balance of like this is just then becomes just like a hyperparameter that we have to tune and depends on like how much privacy we want versus like how much performance we want out of the model. Um, yeah, I'd also like to add that this noise that we're adding, it's primarily being added at the training level. So when you're training, but when you're like creating these noise, uh, like adding noise to the data samples itself. They are kind of like similar yet different kind of techniques. But uh, eventually what the idea is like you're adding noise at each example level during let's say synthetic data generation. Uh, so I hope that answers that question. Yeah. Um, Can I ask, uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, in that sense, like adding noise and having those noise filters should always be like tuned on like when you want to filter out noise. Uh, but again, I think the focus here is to anonymize the data by adding a little noise or like, uh, but the noise filters that you're talking about are the ones that cause breach in privacy, uh, which we are like uh, trying to uh, basically game the system. So yeah. Um, I think it's very case dependent. Uh, let's say if there is not much involvement of uh, you know, sensitive data, then the idea would be to have the least possible amount of noise for the machine learning models to be as accurate as possible. Uh, but however, of during data collection, it's very hard to have that noise because it kind of like disturbs with the you know, distribution of the data itself. So um, I am not 100% sure if that should be the case because it's very subjective. Yeah, I think it's up to the organization. If they want like maintain privacy, then of course like there should be differential privacy, especially is like the topmost technique that is kind of used. And if uh, they are kind of making the model public, then it makes sense to have at least like a minimum level of noise and also like randomness in noise. So it shouldn't be the case that, let's say, attacker is able to guess the level of noise and then everything is kind of exposed. Yeah. So we need like added randomness on top, apart from like minimal level of noise. Yeah, now that I think of it, maybe it's easier to reverse engineer if we know that there is this minimum level of noise being added to all the examples. So yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.